Thankfully, Madeline asked for some popcorn last night because that was part of my children's message, so I didn't even have to pop a bag to be able to talk about that. So if you can see in my bag, I have some popped popcorn, right? But what else? What are, what's in the bottom of the bag that we don't... The seeds. We don't really eat those. How many of you eat the seeds? I know some people do. Scoot back a little bit for me, Jackson, okay? I, the birds eat the seeds. But do you guys eat them? How many of you like the seeds? But how many of you like the popcorn part better? Both of them? I have a secret. I don't like popcorn. I know. I'm so weird. I don't like popcorn or chocolate. It's so weird. I know. How dare me? <laughs> okay. All right. Bring it back so we can talk. Okay, so the seeds, when they pop, they pop into delicious popcorn, a delicious snack that we can have, right? So we wouldn't want those delicious popped kernels of popcorn to turn back to the seeds, would we? No, because it's really not that much fun to eat the seeds. It's more fun to eat the popcorn because it tastes really good and it fills, fills our bellies up, right? So when God sent his son Jesus here... Jesus was sent to die for our sins and so that we could be renewed. And so when we are baptized and we, and we um, give, our old, give our sins and our old self to God and we let Jesus take those sins and carry them for us, we don't really want to go back to our old self, do we? We want to be our new self that God created us in. So whenever we make that decision that we're going to follow Jesus and we're going to believe that Jesus died for our sins, we definitely don't want to go back to our old ways. Sometimes we struggle with that and sometimes we do continue to sin. Um, but thankfully, Jesus died for us. And thankfully, we, can, we know that we can be our new self, just like um, Jesus told us and taught us that we could be. So just remember that whenever you're struggling with something that you might know that you're not supposed to be doing, remember that Jesus died for our sins, and we have the opportunity to give ourselves to Jesus through our baptism and to be created new. All right, friends, let's bow our heads this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here this morning with you, God. We just ask that you bless our time with each other and that your words touch our hearts and we're able to take those words and use them in our lives when we leave from the building today, God. We know that we are your church out in the world. We just ask that you bless each and every one of the children's hearts that sit here this morning and those who may enter through the doors later. We ask all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go line up at the door for Jim. All right, so I have to confess, when I was living in Urbana, I was a member of the <laughs> Panzer Vision crew, which meant that any military history war movie that came out, we got together and went and saw it. And my favorite, I think, of all time war movies is Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. It starts with a World War II veteran visiting a grave in Normandy. And then it flashes to tell the story of how he was rescued by a group of rangers in World War II. How a captain and his men were sent to get him and to take him out of combat because of his brothers being killed in combat. And how they decided to stay and fight to hold a bridge that was very important in a local area there during the fighting. While holding the bridge, the captain who's played by Tom Hanks, is killed. And his dying words to, we find out, this old veteran are, earn this, earn it. It then flashes back to the veteran there in Normandy in current times who asks his wife, have I lived a good life? Have I been a good man? It raises that question. Do we live as those who have been died for? Do we live as those who has made, have had someone make the ultimate sacrifice for us? Please stand as you're able as we look at Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may increase? 
By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, so we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you may obey their desires. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. The question from the movie Saving Private Ryan is the question that we have to ask ourselves. Do we live as those who have been died for? Do we live as those who God's Son came to save? Now we know we can't earn the salvation that came to us through Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God, by the grace of God. We access it by faith in what God has done for us. Paul makes this very clear in the earlier parts of this book, and we've looked at some of those aspects of it, that this is the power of God to save us from not just death, but from sin. The power of God to make us righteous with God when we were in rebellion against God and fighting against God. Yet we are called to live our life differently in light of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Paul tells us that we have died to sin. We no longer serve sin. You know, you're not responsible for your bills once you've passed away, right? I had an aunt that was tired of a company contacting her from a bill that she didn't think was really justified, and so she wrote, it was in my uncle's name, and she wrote across the top, deceased, and sent it back to him. And I had an, actually an incident happen after my wife passed away. About two or three months later, I was contacted by a cell phone company, and they asked to speak to her, and I said, well, you know, that's not possible. Can I talk to you? And they said, well, we need to talk to you about your cell phone bill that was taken out in her name. It was taken out after she passed away by, I suspect, a family member. And I explained to them that that could not have been her. And they said, all you need to do is mail us a copy of the death certificate. And it took care of things. Because you're not responsible for something after you have died. Paul says we have died to sin. We don't have to serve sin anymore. We don't have to be under its reign. It's like a a power that enslaves humans. And he talks about how we are a part of this humanity that's enslaved by sin and it's going to bring death to us. It's almost like a, a force that compels us. But you can die to that and you're no longer under its power. In fact, he says we have been buried with Christ in baptism to be raised to a newness of life. You know, you've probably had that experience where you've gone to a restaurant and it wasn't very good and things didn't turn out very well, maybe with the service or the food, or, or you see that little sign about the health department on there, and you think, oh, I'm not going back there anymore. And then you see the sign that says, under new management. And you think, well, maybe I'll give them another try. Well, folks, when Jesus died for us, we were under new management, no longer a slave a servant to sin. We are now servants to the living God. We are now under the care and the management of the Holy Spirit. We have now been transformed. Look at verse 6-4 of Romans again. Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death 
so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. There's a turning point there when we give our heart to Christ. There's a newness of life that doesn't wait till heaven. It starts right here and now. So the question is, how do we walk in this newness of life? How do we live out that new thing that Christ has created? First of all, I think we have to realize what's happened. Have you ever had a close scrape with death? Have you ever had an illness that it looked like you weren't going to recover from and you did or, or a close scrape with a car accident and you think, I am fortunate to be alive after that? You know, at 94, I was hit head on, had 21 broken bones, collapsed lung, had to do four units of blood. I thought when I woke up in the hospital, my life was over. But God saw otherwise. And I experienced healing and I got to see my kids grow up, and I got to see my grandson born, and I got to do, participate in ministry and life so much since then. And I'm telling you, that close scrape with death made the grass look a whole lot greener afterwards. It made the sky look a whole lot bluer. It made me very thankful for the opportunity to get a second chance. That's what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. He's given us an opportunity to have life when death would have ruled over us. And what Christ has done for us is so much more than a close scrape with death here on earth that might give you a few decades or a few years more. This is about giving us eternity. This is about including us in the very family of God. This is about transforming our lives. We were trapped in evil and sin and death and we couldn't do anything about it. And God reached down and did something for us in Jesus. He broke the chains of sin that would have inevitably led to eternal death. And instead, he gave us the life that Jesus Christ has. The life, the power to overcome, the experience of delivery is incredible. And it makes you want to live fully when you've had one of those close scrapes with death. And this is supposed to inspire us to want to live fully to God, to access all the grace and all the power of God to live that life that glorifies Jesus Christ and says to the world around me, I didn't deserve this, but Jesus gave it to me anyway, and I want you to know about him, and I want you to see how incredible this God is, and I want you to experience the deliverance that I have experienced. You know, our, our theology lesson today is about those Cation words, okay? When you get right with Jesus, it's called justification. It's what God does for us in Jesus Christ. We can't do it for ourselves. He does it for us in Jesus. But then there comes sanctification. And sanctification is what God does in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's that lifelong journey when the Spirit comes into us, and it's a gift to all Christians, and the Holy Spirit starts to mold us and shape us, starts to convict us of things that we're doing wrong that we need to stop doing, starts to guide us to things that we need to start doing, starts to bring those Christian character traits, those gifts of the Spirit, those fruits of the Spirit to work within us, starts to transform us from the inside out. God accepts us as we are in justification. God accepts us no matter how we don't accept ourselves or no matter how we think we've done the unforgivable thing. God says, no, no, I've got the power to make you right. I've got the power to save you. But God doesn't want to leave us in the hole we may have dug for ourselves. God does not want to leave us under the control of sin serving sin, doing destructive things to ourselves and others. God wants to show us how negative sin is, even though it can be fun for a season. And God wants us to move from being in that situation to move to being a better person. God doesn't want you to stay selfish or obnoxious or mean-spirited or gossipy or judgmental or all those negative things that sin brings God loves us too much. We sometimes, on the other hand, want to settle for how it is. You know, this is as good as it gets, God. Don't bug me anymore about this stuff. No, I'm going to hold on to this part, God. 
we have a tendency to give up or to think there's just no way it could get any better than this. We like to settle, but God doesn't want to settle. God wants us to be transformed. You know, there's a, there's a sense where if you really love someone, you help them out of a tough situation, you maybe rescue them even from themselves, but when that love continues, you want to help them to get out of the things that brought them to that situation in the first place. You want to go beyond rescue to helping them to grow and transform so they'll never need that rescue again. So they'll never need that power over them to control them again. You know, how many movies have we seen about the grumpy old man that's transformed by a cute kid or maybe even a pet or maybe the neighbor next door up and Gran Torino and, and uh, I think the, the new Tom Hanks movie is kind of along those lines too. And we celebrate that transformation, that change that comes from the inside, that changes the heart. I, even the Grinch that stole Christmas falls in the grumpy old man changed category. God is in the business of transforming us from the inside out. God has the power that teaches us and changes us and molds us and forms us. And God has the love that compels God to continue working with us when we're ready to give up on ourselves. When we're ready to say, no, you know, God, I'm just going to tolerate myself. I'm just going to accept things. I'll take acceptance when God wants transformation. Now, this was an important teaching of John Wesley, an important part of that early Wesleyan movement. There were a number of revival preachers in Wesley's day. George Whitfield was probably the greatest of all. Benjamin Franklin wrote a funny thing about, you don't want to go hear George Whitfield with any money in your pocket because you'll end up giving it because he was such a persuasive speaker. And thousands of people came and gave their life to Christ after hearing George Whitfield preach. But then he didn't organize anything for them to do next. It was like, you've made that step, now what? And there really wasn't a good next step. It was kind of like going and buying eternal fire insurance and thinking, well, I bought my insurance and I paid the bill, so that's the end of it. When the scripture is full of telling us that this is a journey, this is discipleship, this is a part of, a, of going forward, this is taking up our cross daily and following Jesus, this is being a part of the community of God, this is serving God. Wesley, on the other hand, after people got saved, said, you know, I want you to be a part of this small group. And it's going to be other people who ask you, how is it with your soul? It's going to be other people that study the Bible with you. It's going to be other people that check on you. It's going to be people that encourage you. Sometimes people that challenge you. People that are there for you, that pray for you, that walk beside you. When George Whitfield died, his ministry pretty much died with him. When John Wesley died, there were tens of thousands of people who called themselves Methodists, who were organized into small groups and into churches and into communities, and the movement continued on because we as humans need that encouragement to go on to sanctification. And Wesley's teaching of the Holy Spirit was very biblical and it was very comprehensive. He says it's the Holy Spirit that comes and convicts us of sin, that tells us that something's not right in our life. Even before we accept God, God is at work in our heart and in our life providing opportunities to get to know him. And once that conviction ends in justification, we make a commitment to Jesus Christ that he starts working in our life and that goes on to sanctification. And that's that long journey of life of Jesus molding us into the image of his perfect son. And then he says, when we get to the end of that, and we go be with the Lord, then it's glorification. See all those cations that are in there? And we are formed into the likeness of Christ himself, that we shine the love of God out, that we are in a perfect relationship with God and with one another. It's the difference between enabling somebody and showing the tough love that really helps them to change. See, sometimes that, that difference is a really tough one. 
Sometimes you really struggle with it. I've struggled with it for many, many years in dealing with my son and his addiction issues. That it, you love the person. You want the best for them. But sometimes you love them so much you end up enabling them to continue in their destructive, self-destructive practices. When really what you need to do is have that kind of love that says, I'm here for you and I love you and I'm going to do everything I can to help you, but I'm not going to enable this destructiveness. I'm not going to give you what you always want. It's about giving you what you really need. That's the way God does with us. He takes us where we are, and then he brings transformation because God knows the potential that our life and his grace can create. That our willingness to say yes to Jesus and his power to transform can do, and he will not settle for all that we settle with, God continues to work in our hearts to bring us into that likeness of Christ until we reach the point of our fullest absolute potential. A life transformed by Jesus Christ. Dead to sin and alive to God. A life that impacts the lives of others for good, that brings blessing to family and friends and community, a life that glorifies Jesus Christ, a life that others look at that person and say, there's somebody that knows the Lord. There's somebody that's different because God is working powerfully in their life. You know, we claim that serving Jesus Christ is the greatest thing in life, that it brings us joy, it's, it gives us a goal in life, it's the top of what we can be as a human being. And if that life means anything, then it needs to be a life that brings transformation to us, that changes us and makes us better every step in the way. I really believe the only way to happiness is a life lived in relationship to God. That there's a God-shaped hole within our heart and our soul that nothing but God can fill. And when that power of God comes into our life, it brings a change that can be incredible. But we have to let it happen. We have to take up that cross. We have to embrace that path of discipleship. We have to put ourselves in the places where we can be fed and transformed. We have to allow our brothers and sisters in Christ to be around us, even though that's a challenge sometimes because loving one another is one of the hardest things we have to do. And we have to grow and allow that growth to happen. And sometimes Growth is painful. Maybe all the times growth is painful. It's like, you know, losing those old teeth, those baby teeth, and getting a new one. It's like the, the pain of having to change. It's the pain of getting more and more responsible and all the things that come with that. But Jesus came to give us abundant life, and that abundant life starts right here on earth with the transformation of our lives into the likeness of Jesus Christ with the power of God unleashed within us. Are you experiencing that abundant life now? Are you walking in the newness of life? Do you tell sin and temptation, you no longer have control of me. I do not have to do what you're trying to convince me to do. I don't have to embrace what the world says I should embrace. I don't have to be a part of these things. I belong to Jesus now. I'm under new management. I'm under the management of a God who loves me and wants the best for me. Have you been walking in newness of life? It's not too late to start the journey. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You let his spirit come into your heart. And you start seeking to know and to serve him more and more. You read the word, you connect with the people of God, you get in a, a group that feeds you and guides you and, and challenges you. You continue to be open and don't grieve the Spirit, but allow it to work within your life. And as we look at next week, you continue in that struggle against sin, but the power of a Savior is there to help you get through. And we'll look at kind of part two as we look at Paul's struggling with being the person that we're called to be even when our human nature wants to go back to that old person. God loves you. God wants the best for you. 
God has the power to transform you from the inside out. Will you accept what God has done for you? Through Jesus Christ, will you embrace that? Will you live your life in such a way as to glorify the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your incredible love. That that love continues not just from the beginning of our journey, but through our whole life and on into eternity. And Lord, help us to be willing to embrace that love and to live on the basis of that love. Help us to be willing to take up the cross and to be disciples of Jesus Christ who boldly went where others were afraid to go, who boldly stood where others were afraid to stand, who took upon himself the mission that you gave him and embraced even the suffering and the shame to glorify you, to serve you, to be the obedient Son of God. Father, help us to follow Jesus, for we pray this in his precious name. Amen.